Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You'll never have the sacred stone. <laughs> oh, this you crazy mother. All right. We are back for another season of Amateur Hour. I'm Cody Quartz, the president, CEO, commandant of the Southeast Texas Play Football League. And here with me is... Troy Maddox, the vice president. Hey, hey, what's up? No, oh, nothing, Troy. So it's been several months now since we've had football. I'm sure everyone misses it. I know I miss it. Um, what have you been doing? Getting ready for this season. Really? Getting ready. Getting getting back in shape. Well, I've been sort of. <laughs> ra- round is a shape. So I've been drinking, sleeping, and thinking. So. Uh, <laughs> You know, with that, we uh, want to welcome all the teams that are playing in the Football is Coming 3 tournament. It's our third straight year to do it, and it's awesome because it's really hot. Heat stroke is very, very uh, uh, much the reality. So cramps, heat stroke, and at least some amount of football. So um, as y'all have seen on the website and on the uh, on Facebook and everything, we're trying to do kind of a Game of Thrones thing this year. Troy and I are Game of Thrones nerds. And if you guys don't watch Game of Thrones or you don't like it, well, you can go right to hell. Because I do. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So we've done this neat thing that uh, we like where we have all the teams set up. We have an early division and a later division. Or, as uh, you might call it, a hot division and a really hot division. So um, what we'll do is we'll run through the early division first. Troy will give us the team name. I'll tell you what their sigil is. It's a Game of Thrones reference, by the way. And I'll uh, then tell you what their uh, their words are. So, for those of you who aren't experienced with Game of Thrones, just turn it off or fast forward to the next segment when we'll talk about something you really like. But for now, we'll go ahead and go with that. So go ahead, Troy. Well, we have to start. We're going to start with uh, the probably the greatest flag football team ever put together on earth they've ruled the seven kingdoms for as long as you can think back to that would be the herd ah the herd the herd sigil is the stoic bison and their words are win lose or tie herd till i die now they have ruled the seven kingdoms for a time or they did but it's much like the baratheon rule ripe with incest and uh other stuff that makes it not so much really a Baratheon rule, more like a Lannister rule, or a Showstopper rule if you want to have that, maybe even a Jack Boys rule. Either way, the Herd Sigil was on King's Landing at some point, for better or worse, for right or wrong. So, there you go, that's with the Herd. <laughs> Anything on that? Uh, I think you hit it best right there. That's about as good as you can describe the Herd and uh, the, their rule throughout Westeros. Okay, alright. Moving on to the next team, the Wolf Pack. Since this team has just given me their name, their sigil will simply be a wolf, because that's the best I can think of currently, and their <laughs> words will be flapjacks, because that's what they said the most on the group text message that I'm on with them. So you guys can think johnny acevedo and other people whose phone numbers are in my phone but i don't know their names for uh the uh the the, uh the words flapjacks so we'll consider them basically the the gray joys overall on the (laughs) iron islands they can be the gray joys they control a bridge they siege towers no real plan but somehow they end up in power a lot uh these guys are a mashup of the punishers the diamondbacks and people from places unknown so I don't know what to expect from them. They seem to have, got, have a guy that can play quarterback, but uh, I guess we shall see. They're, they're kind of an unknown. They might even be Provosi. I don't know. Well, good luck. Good luck. Uh, the next team on the list here for the uh, early group is Team Squad Elite. Squad Elite. The Squad Elite sigil is the Mongoose, and their words are, We are family." because this was purported to me to be Marvin Williams' team composed of his family. I had no idea that Marvin was related to Tootie and uh, (laughs) other people on that team, but I guess he is. So uh, they're kind of a mixture of the 409 boys, I think some of the Beaumont stars, and people that have played on and off with uh, the Hurricanes for years and years and years. So they should have a pretty good group. Tootie's a good quarterback. Um, 
not sure who else they have that's uh, going to be playing. I think Debion Foster's playing for them, and he's a really good rusher. So we'll see. I, I, I hope they have some chemistry. So since they're all family, we're going to consider them the phrase? I think they could do better than the phrase because the phrase are just so dirty. That's true, um, yeah. Maybe they could be Craster and his million daughters because they really that's, are family. Yeah, that's, that's very true. <laughs> or the Dothraki, even. I'm sure they're related on something. That's true, and they are, they're very good at what they do. Yeah. Okay, so the next team on the list of the morning group is the defending champion of the uh, Winter Classic, the 2017 Winter Classic, Texan Flag Football. The sigil for Texan Flag Football is the lion because they're the king of the jungle. And their words are, spread the field. Those guys do spread the field pretty well. It's pretty neat to watch them play, actually. They, uh, they beat people in so many ways. We only, we've only been able to play with them once in the uh, Winter Tournament. But they did great, and they are they are a uh, they're a class act, you know. So they've beaten the team that won the last league. I think they've beaten pretty much every team that's going to be in this tournament that they played. So right now their sigil is the lion, and if I had to compare them to a house, I would compare them to the Lannisters from a few seasons ago when Tywin was really important. Now after Tywin died, I can't vouch for the Lannisters. They're, they're, they've they've kind of gone off the rails. Cersei can't hold it. That's right. They were they they were more in control then, and I uh, I agree with that. And the next team on the list is the defending champion of the spring SCTX FFL league, and that is the Jack Boys. The Jack Boys sigil is the cheetah, because those guys are blazing fast, and their words, of course, which have been spoken before, are Jack Boys, Jack Boys, Jack Boys. Taylor Labrie. Um, those guys are super fast and super talented. Um, if they show up with their whole group and Tone shows up for quarterback, um, or even Tori and Lott shows up to play quarterback, they're going to be great. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing them play against some of these uh, teams that have come from Houston. And I, you know, I can't say anything else about them. They're super fast and super athletic, and they have a lot of chemistry. They pitch the ball all up and down the field. It's really fun to watch. Yeah, they're always a tough one. So anytime you play with them, it's it's fun to watch, but it's you hate to play against them because you never know when they're going to break one deep on you. So uh, they're a good team. And uh, what house would you consider them? They are most comparable to. You know, that's a tough one. I'm going to say they're they're most com comparable to House Aaron. They're the Lords of the Vale. When everything's going, oh, we just need good someone one. to come in and and kill somebody or win or whatever. The Lords of the Vale come in, win, and they just leave. That's just all they do. And is, is Seth Corcoran Littlefinger? Seth Corcoran is Lord <laughs> Baelish, yes. <laughs> yes, he organizes everything. Oh, that's and good. And then he's mysteriously absent whenever um, whenever things are going wrong. Yeah. So. Uh, the next team on the list, uh, a very good team, very uh fun to play with as well, the 409 boys. The 409 boys sigil is the Hurricanes because that was how they were birthed many, many years ago. In the eye of the storm far, far away, the Hurricanes were born, which is kind of strange because I guess a hurricane kind of has to be there before the eyes there. But either way, <laughs> their sigil is the Hurricanes because that was their team a long time ago, and their words are forces combined. Because they're good on every side of the ball and in every position, and everybody has their role, and they play it great. Um, you know, I saw Byron score a bunch of touchdowns uh, during the last league, and people were laughing because Byron was scoring touchdowns. And I thought, yeah, he would be the most athletic person on our team. Like, yeah, but he can't catch. And I thought, <laughs> Neither he can catch better than anyone else on our team. <laughs> so, Clint's got a good group of guys. They have four or five people that can play quarterback. Um, a bunch of people can go and get the ball. Miller is always a force on defense. And I think the Bronsons are playing with them, so that'll be fun too. I would consider them the Targaryens because at once they were the dominant force in all of the land, and uh, they were overtaken. But now they're trying to take it back. So that's now what I would consider them. They're sailing across the narrow sea, just waiting, waiting on their opportunity. And they've got dragons. And they have dragons. And there were dragons. And there were dragons. The next team uh, in the group is the uh, a new team to the tournament. The Bayou City Cowboys. 
Bayou City Cowboys sigil is the fucking Bronco because that's going to look cool when I put the little graphic up on the uh, thing here. And uh, their words are <laughs> have football, will travel because that's the other thing I know of them is that, well, they're from Houston. They probably have a football and they're willing to travel here. Uh, from what I've heard, <laughs> and we were drinking when we came up with these. <laughs> yeah. So... <laughs> It was a lot funnier then. <laughs> um, so, from what I've heard, they're really talented. Um, they win a lot. And that's about all I know about them. I know Quintus Braddock is a pretty cool dude because he actually calls me and, and speaks to me, which is becoming a dwindling few people. So I appreciate Quintus <laughs> for listening. I, I really appreciate you calling me and asking me about stuff. And, uh, you know, um, can't wait to meet you guys. So, there you go. I'm like I'm excited about that. I, I'm happy that we got a new team coming in. It's gonna be fun, um, and good luck to them. Uh, the last team in the tournament, last team on the list, and the last team in my heart is the Showstoppers. The Showstoppers. The, the Showstopper sigil is the shooting star. You know because of their shirts and all. And their words are all to arms because everyone on the team can play quarterback at some level or another. Walt can play quarterback. Um, Theron can play quarterback. That fella whose name was like Geth or something can play quarterback. Oh, yeah, and Jacob Diltz is pretty good at it too, I guess. Uh, so, you know, they're awesome. They're a great team. They can win any tournament or any league we do. Um, now, the house I compare them to, though, is going to be uh, high, uh, what, what, the, the Tyrells. The Tyrells? Yes, the they're high the Tyrells. They're very perfumed and they're just, you know, I, I feel like Walt might be the queen of thorns. <laughs> Walt's kind of like Lady Olena. I won't tell you which one reminds me of Loris because I think I might hurt people's feelings. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Walt's uh, Lady Olena and um, Theron could be Marjorie because he's a good looking guy. So, there you go. <laughs> I, I was almost considering them more like uh, the Starks because they were... They're not good people, they, no. But, no, I'm just saying they're uh, they're... The way they were also kind of lords of the north, they were kings of the north, and then uh, they've all been broken up, and then they all come back together somehow, like the Starks are now. So that's what I would consider. I'm kind of going around it with some lo logic on that one. Maybe but. they could be the Boltons. No, oh, nobody wants to be the Boltons. <laughs> well, nobody wants to be the Boltons. <laughs> they're not sure. that. They're not that hard of people. They're not that mean. They're not mean like that. You no, know, Bruce Bolton never seemed mean until the Red Wedding. I'm just saying. God. Because the best way to be mean is to act really nice on the surface. I feel like Walt might have us all taken out at some point. <laughs> just joking, uh, Walt. You're all right. Even though you were in Denver or something, you can come hang out. Yeah, Johnny Willis is Ramsey Bolton. <laughs> no, Johnny, Johnny Willis is some ashamed grandfather Bolton that wondered how it all, how it all went awry. Yeah. <laughs> Although, it, I guess it did. But there you go. Um, so, those are the teams. Um, we'll really, well, we will release the schedule Tuesday. This actually won't be released until Thursday, so you'll have already seen the schedule. Um, Troy, any closing thoughts on the, the tournament? What's going on? What's going to happen? Man, I'm just excited to uh, be back playing again. Uh, I know several teams have been playing in other tournaments around the area, Houston, up in the Piney Woods, and... Uh, had some fun but i think it's uh time to get back down to our our league and start a uh, wrecking shop i think it's fun i'm excited to see everybody uh back and it's gonna be fun yeah i can't wait you know i've, I've had people tell me that you know we could get a lot more teams we have more fields and more things to do in that uh, of that nature and that's cool and i would really enjoy it but to me more teams doesn't make a more fun tournament to me what makes it more fun is that we get super organized with everything we come out there with um you know, all kind of uh, little goodies and stuff to give to people, t-shirts, put those things on film, put them on the internet. Um, it's kind of like big rock concerts in the 80s played to stadiums. Okay, that might have been fun to play in a stadium, but, you know, to me, if I had to say one or the other, I wish I would have been in a Nirvana concert with 400 people at a club, <laughs> then went and watched Queen at uh, a stadium. I think that would be a better story. So. Yeah, the acoustics are very not very good in those so big stadiums. So let's just call our tournament, <laughs> instead of small, let's just say it's an intimate tournament. I like it. I like it. 
All right. So, Everybody bring your money because we're going to have shirts for sale. Yeah, bring your money. We'll have shirts for sale. Um, we might even have a... Uh, Thunderbolts and lightning. Yeah. Very, very frightening. Yeah. We might even have Troy's mixtape from his rap career for sale, so you never know. What? What? Uh, what? <laughs> so, all right, well, uh, stay tuned for the next segment when we'll discuss... Uh, some uh, NFL topics that aren't really flag football related, but we might even throw the words flag football in there anyway. So stay tuned. music that I choose to put in between these segments. So the name of this segment, it's going to be an ongoing thing for the next few weeks, is the top three according to me and me. It's uh, Troy and I, uh, Troy and my favorite players or top three players or whatever from uh, each team in the NFL ever, ever. So we're going to do the NFC East today and we're going, not the NFC East, the NFC East today for all of those of you up on that. I consider most of it the yeast, though. Yes. So the uh, <laughs> the first team is the Dallas Cowboys. So, Troy, I'll let you go first. Tell me your top three Dallas Cowboys ever. All right. This was kind of tough. Uh, you know that I'm not a big Cowboys fan. I know. You're a but terrible person. trying to narrow down the Cowboys' top three players was, to me, was almost impossible because there are just so many – choices to choose from and I mean so many great players I not narrowed it down to three and I have one honorable mention so uh, and this first one was one that was tough for me because if you're the all-time leader in a certain statistic you have to be the top three on your team so I went with Emmett Smith I mean that's just you know to me you have the all-time leader uh, rushing yardage that make you have to be the one of the top three players in your team so that's that's pretty impressive so I went with Emmett Smith uh, it was tough for me to choose between Emmitt Smith and Troy Aikman because Aikman was the leader of that team for so long. You know, led that team, was a Super Bowl MVP. Smith was as well. But uh, Aikman was just such a good leader for that team, really brought him back to uh, prominence. Uh, but he would be – Aikman would be my honorable mention. But Emmitt Smith would be my number one or one of the top three players for the Dallas Cowboys. Number two would be Larry Allen on the offensive line. Seven-time first-team All-Pro. That's incredible. Seven years in a row. Uh, and, of course, the all he made the all-decade team in the NFL in the 90s and the 2000s. That's pretty incredible to be that good. And just he was considered the strongest man in the NFL and uh, just a great offensive lineman for all those years, uh, Super Bowl champion as well. And then the number three or just the other player in the top three would be Roger Staubach with two Super Bowl championships, played in three more Super Bowls, uh, Basically, you know, the original quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys, basically. The guy that started it all. And uh, just that's one of those things where it's so tough to uh, pick between all these guys, but I consider him one of the top three in my list. Who's your honorable mention? Uh, Troy Aikman would be my honorable mention. I went up. Yeah, he, I just think he has more Super Bowl wins than Staubach, but played in less and had a probably a much better team around him. I don't. I can't remember all of the Cowboys from the 70s, so I don't know which team would actually be considered well, better. Well, you remember that. Uh, I don't know, sleep, drugs, alcohol, I don't know. It's not that you weren't alive? Oh, damn, that's it. No, oh, okay. Well, Troy Aikman looks a bit to me like a largemouth bass, which is strange. Um, all right, my top three for the Cowboys, who are my favorite team, are Emmett Smith. You've already covered him. And, I mean, you know, the guy's awesome. I, I was looking at his stats earlier, and when he was in Arizona, uh, for his very last year, the guy ran for 937 yards, you know, in a time when uh, people weren't running the ball nearly as much. So a really long career, and his last year he almost got to 1,000 yards. So I think that's pretty awesome. Um, my next up on the list is another one you uh, you said, Larry Allen. I mean, Aikman would have been Aikman without Larry Allen, and neither would Emmett, and neither would Irvin, because that was such an important position. So, you know, he was a big part of those Super Bowls. Now my third on the list and my favorite Dallas Cowboy of all time, of all time, is Tony Romo. 
Now let me tell you some, some reasons why. So, I think most people think Aikman is the best Cowboys quarterback ever. Well, here are their stats side by side. Aikman played 12 years and Romo played 9 years. Um, Aikman's quarterback rating over those 12 years was 81.6. Romo's quarterback rating over those 9 years was 97.1. Aikman threw 165 touchdowns and 141 interceptions. Romo threw 248 touchdowns and 117 interceptions. Romo threw for 34,000 yards and Aikman threw for 33,000 yards. And Romo played three less years than Aikman behind a worse line with worse defense, with you know worse talent all around him, with a worse running back. And I, you know, I, I don't, I don't see how, you know, you could ever. Um, I don't see how, statistically speaking, you could say that the man's not awesome. Uh, he holds every important Cowboy record for a quarterback. And despite everybody saying he's bad in the clutch, I think he was the, has the best record for uh, fourth or best quarterback rating in fourth quarters where games matter for the last however many years. And I'm kind of pulling that out of my hat there. But I, I've heard that at some point. I'm sure it was true at some time. My, I'm, I'm not going to disagree with you. He's a probably he's the best quarterback statistically in the franchise history. My only argument against Tony Romo is that Aikman, even Staubach, they have more Super Bowl wins than Romo has playoff wins. That's, that's my the, only argument. I know it's a different time, and then the team, of course, obviously wasn't as good as those other guys. That's just my only argument. It, take it or leave it. It's not. I'm not trying to dispute that. No, that he's not a great cowboy. My only thing with that is uh, they didn't have a salary cap. Romo had a salary cap. They had organization and structure and things built into it. Romo was risen like a phoenix from the ashes. Um, and was never even planned to be their star quarterback. He was undrafted to go right for Drew Bledsoe because Bledsoe was hurt. So, I like Tony. Tony, if you're listening to this, man, you were great. I doubt he's listening. So, see, that's what do you think? That's why Bledsoe should probably be the greatest quarterback of all time because he opened the door <laughs> for Tom Brady and Tony Romo. Bledsoe, I guess, kind of like Johnny Carson's show, Bledsoe's like the Ed McMahon for <laughs> Quarterback, so he just he just brings he them in the door for the two yeah. two of the biggest statistical quarterbacks of all time. All right, the next team is the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, my picks for that team are Brian. Uh, and, and bear in mind when I'm telling you about most of these picks, um, I kind of pick players that I think of as that team. So I'm I'm certain that they were not the most statistically uh, wonderful players, but these are these are the people that make me think of the Eagles. Brian Dawkins makes me think of the Eagles. Um, he had a really good career with Philadelphia. He was a good safety, and um, he made the Pro Bowl, I'm sure. That's all the research I've done. <laughs> um, Terrell Owens, to me, is uh, was unbelievable at Philadelphia, then he was unbelievable at San Francisco, then he was unbelievable at Dallas for that short amount of time, so um, he kind of made any quarterback look great. And Donovan McNabb. Now, a lot of people talk a lot of crap on McNabb, but he was there when they were, you know, getting close to Super Bowls, and I, I think he went to the Super Bowl. Yep. I can't remember. But, you know, he was the beneficiary of Andy Reid, but someone has to be. And McNabb did a good job, and he was tough. You know, he he, uh, he played a lot of years there and, and uh, did a lot of good things. Go ahead, Troy. I, I, I can't uh, – I think that's pretty good. I like Brian Dawkins. That was a good choice. Um, ferocious defensive player. Uh, my my three top three Philadelphia Eagles of all time start with uh, Randall Cunningham, who in my mind could be a guy that's uh, top three for several – a couple teams. So uh, we may have to revisit that topic a little later. But Randall Cunningham, the original dual-threat quarterback. He revolutionized the position. So athletic, uh, making plays all over the field, could run, outrun people, could throw the ball farther than anybody. Was just a, a fun guy to watch. He's one of those Tech Mobile guys where you take him around in and run, and just he he created a different position. Basically, it wasn't a stand in the pocket throw position after he he started uh, playing from UNLV. Uh, yeah, uh, number two, Reggie White. See, Reggie White obviously should be on there, but 
I didn't what, put him on. Yeah, I'm not saying he's I'm not saying he's one of my favorite players of all time, but you just look statistically, eight seasons in Philadelphia, 124 sacks before going to Green Bay and winning That's a couple good. Winning Super Bowl and. Uh, he was a six-time first-team All-Pro while he was in Philadelphia. Leader of that defense with you know Jerome Brown and Seth Joyner and all those guys. Uh, he was he was the leader of that defense. And then uh, my number three is also one of yours is uh, Terrell Owens, whose middle name is El Dorado in my research, which is just is that the uh, road? awesome. Is that no? That's not the road. What is Dorado? El Dorado. I don't. No, the Dorado. That's well, not two words. It's one word, El Dorado. But anyway, that's yeah. that's hilarious. Anyway, he only played 21 games with Philadelphia and scored 20 touchdowns in those 21 games. And then in the Super Bowl that they played in, he missed all the playoffs with a broken leg, came back for the Super Bowl, was not cleared by doctors to play in the Super Bowl, played anyway, had 11 catches for over 100 yards on a broken leg in the Super Bowl that they lost to New England by three points or whatever. Uh, so he's one of my favorite players of all time and uh, was just incredible for the 21 games he was in uh, Philadelphia. So there's a, a neat stat about Terrell Owens is that uh, he has the same number of Super Bowl wins that he has dollars right now. <laughs> so. Zero is a hell of a number. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, he might have more Super Bowl wins than dollars then. <laughs> Back taxes are a bitch. Yeah. Uh, they sure are. All right, next up on the list, this might be my favorite one because I know the least about it, are the Washington Redskins. So, Troy, go ahead and give me your Redskins. All right, my top three, and here I also had an honorable mention on the Redskins. My oh, top wait, 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 wait. Before you go, um, I know that it's controversial to say Redskins right now, so we'll go with highly pigmented people. Native People. Okay, there you go. All right, go ahead. Um, for those guys, I'm going with uh, Daryl Green as my number one uh, from Houston, Texas. Uh, fastest player of all time in the NFL. Uh, 20 seasons in the NFL, and only three of those seasons he didn't play all 16 games. Uh, 54 total interceptions, four-time first-team All-Pro defensive back in the 19, NFL 90s All-Decade team. So, uh just longevity like that, just being able to play that many games throughout your career in a position where you're, you know, you're getting thrown at all the time. You've got a lot, of, you get exposed a lot out there, and he made it that long, and uh, was so productive, and was still one of the fastest players throughout his 20 years. So, very good player, awesome. Uh, my number two would be John Riggins. Uh, you look at his stats; doesn't really have great stats. Had about 8,000 yards rushing, but was a, a, a just an amazing character back then. With you know. Wearing mohawks and fur suits and stuff like that, he was a he was a different guy, uh, but he was an '80s All Decade uh, team for the NFL and has one of the most iconic touchdowns in Super Bowl history against the Dolphins, breaking loose and running like 40 some yards for a touchdown to beat the Dolphins in the Super Bowl. Uh, so that's why I chose him. And then my number three was Joe Theismann. He's still the all-time passing leader in Washington Redskins history. He retired after a broken leg in '85. So what happened to his leg? Lawrence Taylor happened to his leg. Oh, okay. He destroyed him and at the end of his career, but he was still the all-time. He's still the all-time leading passer in the history. My honorable mention, who I think if he was still alive today, would probably be the best player in Redskins history, was Sean Taylor. Uh, he ended up. He got murdered one season in the middle of one season by whatever some robbers or whatever. That does hurt your stance. But he was so incredible on the field. The way he played, he was so aggressive. Just could make tackles out of the field, could chase people down, make interceptions. Was a great special teams player. Uh, and he would be probably the best player of all time in that team's history. But too bad he was uh, murdered. So that's my top three. All right. Those are really great. I can't argue with them uh, because I don't know anything about them. Um, so uh, my, my first one is Daryl Green. You know, you already said it. The man played forever, and he played at a high level forever. So uh, the next one on my list is for a weird reason. His name is Art Monk. And the reason I picked Art Monk is because my dad used to say that he liked Art Monk a lot. For whatever reason, that made me uh, really like Art Monk. Nostalgic. Yeah. That's, well, that's why I pick most of these people. What a name. Now, the third guy on my list, um, I actually found a recording from wherever he was... Uh, when he was drafted, so I'll, I'll just, I'll just actually it's not when he was drafted. It was just kind of to sum up his his career. So I'll just go ahead and play that recording now. So here here it is. Dateline, Washington, 1937. Redskins. 
Giants draft rookie quarterback slinging Sammy Ball from the minor league baseball system. Sammy Ball leads the Redskins to a Super Bowl or an NFL championship, as it was known at that time, against the Chicago Bears in 1937. Ball went on to perfect such moves as the forward pass, the hot pitch, and the move around the guy really fast, which later came to be known as the juke. Ball would retire and live on a ranch where he developed Alzheimer's disease and forgot everything and couldn't play football anymore. Then he died. So my third player on that was uh, Sammy Ball. Um, I thought he had, um, I, you know, I looked up his stats and I, I realized he was probably playing against roofers and plumbers that were out of work and uh, probably a Probably a lady or two. I don't even know what they did back then. It was like during World War II. But in 1944, when they played like, I don't know, eight and a half games against teams like the Mannheim Steamroller or something, the guy threw for uh, 2,900 yards and 25 touchdowns. And uh, I, I can't think that, that, you know, like Des Bryant was playing back then or something. So he's probably throwing to like, you know, Don Hudson, uh, Ace Paga, or Wizzo White. <laughs> Those are real people, by F the way. F.T. Tittlesworth. F.T. Tittlesworth caught a ball and a touchdown. That or in a game. That game, that game they played against the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, they were, they, he was amazing. He was amazing. Then yeah. the people know that Ball went on to an acting career. Acting in such movies as, Spit Now, Shirley, I'll Knock Your Teeth Out. <laughs> Other movies such as, Yes, I Want Ham. What do you think about that, Sonny? And then the classic comedy, Sammy Ball, Slinging Those Balls. So, that is, uh, you okay? <laughs> okay. So that's my third player for uh, the Redskins. Now, oh, God. the last team for the NFC East is the Giants. Um, the New York football Giants? Yes, the New York football Giants. You know, I bet Chris Berman's microphone smells like old man spit and death. But it smells like salami. <laughs> it smells like meat. Um, okay, so the uh, the next team is the Giants. Uh, my three players are um, Eli Manning. Just because, I mean, I know that he doesn't look awesome when he's playing, and he often looks like he might uh, have a touch of the downs. But i got to give it to him. Uh, you know, in the, when the Super Bowl comes, he's uh, he's awesome. He, he, he plays well. He plays well in the clutch. He gets hit really hard, gets up and plays. I, I like him. Um my next one's Tiki Barber because he reminds me of the Giants. And I've always thought of Tiki Barber as a stand-up guy that, uh, you know, was uh, fun to watch play football, basically. Uh, I don't have any stats for these people, but I'm sure they're fine. The last guy on my list is a guy named Mark Vivaro who played tight end for the Giants in the 80s and early 90s. The reason I chose Mark Bavaro was there was a sweet-ass play in Tecmo Super Bowl where you could do a flea flicker um, back to Phil Sims, and he would throw it really deep to Mark Bavaro. So he was my favorite player for that couple of years when I was a child, and he's on my list for that reason. Tecmo Super Bowl. Those are those are good choices. I'm surprised you didn't choose like Dave Meggett because you couldn't tackle him in Tecmo Super Bowl. Dave Meggett was my fourth. Okay. Well, there you go. Uh, let's see. My top three for the New York Giants. Uh, number one, Lawrence Taylor. Yeah, uh, pretty good. 132 and a half sacks. Ten-time first-team All-Pro. Uh, the M the MVP of the league in 1986. Uh, Three-time defensive MVP. Was on the NFL 75th anniversary team. Uh, and he turned linebacker into a downhill sack position instead of more of a play the line and coverage he, he changed the way you know the game was played so probably the most ferocious defender of all time with speed and, and aggressiveness um his later years have have been something different but he was one of the best defensive players of all time yeah i heard he could he could do a healthy amount of cocaine too <laughs> good for him uh number two is uh this one's hard for me because i, I don't like him as a player but Eli Manning just seems to be uh, – if he ever get, makes it into the playoffs, he's pretty pretty tough to beat. He's always good in the playoffs. Uh, he's played every game in the league since 2005, every single game. Uh, every game for every team? For every team. Giants. He's played every game for every team. <laughs> uh, 
um, for the since 2005. He's got he has 320 touchdowns. Obviously, the two-time Super Bowl champ. And you can't spell elite without Eli. Uh-huh, that's pretty good. I know he had 320 touchdowns. That's pretty great. Yeah, that, I know. That's it's, a lot it of touchdowns. more than I thought. Um, so that, that's pretty impressive. And then my number three, I went way back to the 60s with Y.A. Tittle, uh, the NFL MVP, four-time first-team All-Pro. And he was throwing for 3,000 yards back in the 60s when there wasn't as much forward passing. Yes. So that's pretty impressive, and he still has an NFL ties, holds an NFL record with seven touchdown passes in a game in the '60s. So uh, I think I think Peyton t- has actually tied that. But Y. A. Tittle, you know, you could have probably gone with Phil Simms, who has a couple Super Bowl championships. But I think that's more fun when you have a guy that has been has things like that that you probably don't have on film, but it's still fun to see and say the name Y. A. Tittle. You know, Sammy Ball knocked every tooth out of Y. A. Tittle's mouth one time. Just you don't fun. need teeth. So you don't have to wear a mouthpiece then if you don't have teeth. <laughs> That's not real, by the way. That probably yeah. never happened. Same at all. Same at all. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, any closing thoughts on, on that whole thing there? Uh, no, I think this is pretty fun. I want to hear other people's uh, top three for each team. So uh, if, if you've got the uh, time or the inclination to uh, let us know, I'd like to hear everybody's top three. How about if you got the balls? Go ahead and put your top three on there. The Sammy balls? Oh, yeah. Get um, it, all right, get it, play yeah. on words there. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, okay, so I'll post this to uh, Facebook at some point, YouTube, and all those other things. So if you guys have your top three players, um, or you want to talk about how Troy and I are ridiculous, then uh, go ahead. We welcome it all. Um, all right, well, uh, stay tuned for the next segment when we will talk about the first class of the SETX FFL Hall of Fame. Stay tuned. We will dance on the floor and around. People always told me, be careful what you do. Don't go around breaking young girls' hearts. Mother always told me. All right, we're back with the third segment of Amateur Hour. Uh, In this segment, we're going to talk about the very first class of uh, the SEPXFFL Hall of Fame. Um, We've decided to kind of give, give back to our guys who have played forever. You know, most of these guys, in fact, almost all of them, didn't actually play in our league. Our league's only three years old. But this is more of the flag football in general Hall of Fame for us, for Southeast Texas. So, uh, Troy, I'll let you go ahead and announce the first name for uh, this year's class. All right. The uh, first inductee of the first class of the year of 2017 of the SCTX FFL is quarterback for the Untouchables, number 31, Kevin Holden. Yes, Kevin Holden. He was uh, he played for a very long time when we played out in Vider that we played in the Vider League, and then also I think he played in one of the first Beaumont leagues for forever. He made decisions like no one I've ever seen at quarterback. He knew where everybody was going to be, and I think they probably practiced just as much as anybody else does now, which is you know like zero. <laughs> um, Holden was not a small man, but he had those very uh, delicate hips that he could get through people. Um, my favorite thing that I've ever heard Kevin Holden say was uh, I was I was foolishly trying to play quarterback one day when I was about 18, and I asked him uh, the question, Kevin, what am I doing wrong at quarterback? What 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 do I need to do to be play play quarterback? And he said, Well, your problem is you're not a quarterback, you're a center. So just go play center. <laughs> so that is my favorite Kevin Holden memory. So he even has Hall of Fame advice as well. Yes, what he a, does. What a man. And depressing Hall of Fame <laughs> uh, Kevin and I had a bunch of battles back and forth whenever I played on the cones and he was on the untouchables. They beat us every time except for maybe once or twice. They were uh, just a dominant team in the league, had athletes all over, and he was the force of that team. Could Had the hips to avoid getting sacked. I was rushing back then, and we were just back and forth, back and forth. I'd get so close to pulling his flag, and I'd miss, or finally get him, and it'd be exciting just to be able to get his flag. Someone sacked Kevin Holden. Look at that. Um, and he is uh, well-deserving of being in the Hall of Fame of uh, the Flag Football League in Southeast Texas. It's uh, It was fun playing against him, but it was frustrating because you'd think I've, you got a sack every time. Every play you thought you had a sack, and you could never get it. He was just – he'd just turn of a hip, and then he'd throw the ball to anybody and make plays. So it was uh, – he's well-deserving to be in the Hall of Fame. And what a great guy. 
All right, give us my next one. The second inductee, this class of 2017, is linebacker for the herd number 59, Barney Quartz, or as we like to call him, Bubba Quartz. And most of y'all probably know that that's actually my dad. Um, and uh, please don't think that he's in here because he's my dad. That's that's the farthest thing from the truth. Um, no, but. My dad did a lot to keep flag football going around here. He helped me build the first league we did in Viner. He was uh, invited me to play on their team when I was like 15 or 16 years old, and the man played forever. He played from his mid 20s until he until last year when he's you know is getting to be his mid 50s, and he could pull flags really well. He was uh, really good blocking back, kind of one of those unsung heroes of, of flag football, you know. So I. I appreciate everything my dad's done for flag football and, of course, for me. So, congratulations there, Dad, although I'm sure you're fishing and not listening to this. <laughs> it's always fun playing with uh, Bubba. He was He's always got a, a good attitude all the time. He's, you, nothing could ever make him mad out there. And he was always good at pulling flags, even into his, his older age. He could still go out there and pull flags. And, and he pulled flags with fingers that were only about an inch long. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Chasing down people with legs that were only about half, just twice as long as that. He's basically all torso. He's he's the hydrant. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what I like about him is, growing up when I was little, we you know we played. He was the coach of other teams, your coach in little league, and I'd play against him, and and then we end up playing together uh, in flag football for many years. And uh, he was just you know ultra competitive and uh, had a good time. Was always, but like I said, always had a good attitude out on the field. So, congratulations, Barney. And what a great guy. Yes, that's what I've heard. All right, uh, give, give us the next one here. The uh, next inductee into the Hall of Fame, class 2017, is from the Showstoppers, number 23, Kenny Croak. Kenny Croak, um, you know, is also another guy that played flag football forever, and I think was really important to it, you know, keeping on going in this area. Kenny has an excellent an excellent attitude. When I told him that he was going to be inducted in the Hall of Fame, he was like really nice about it, you know. But Kenny's been a high-level athlete from the time he was, I'm sure, in his 20s when I was merely a babe until, you know, now he could probably outrun me. The man's in his 50s. So I, I always loved playing with Kenny. He always had a really good attitude and was always, um, you know, he was always a really good part of their team no matter how old he was and no matter what position he played, he could do anything. Yeah, what, what I liked about uh, Kenny was like he had positive attitude all the time would, and, and would give you good advice as well on the sideline if he'd come and talk to you and tell you what's what's doing good, what's what's going wrong, you know, how to get better at this, and always had good advice. Uh, great flag puller, always he could make you miss and you know catch a ball in the middle of the field and get by you, and it would be frustrating, like, why is this guy doing this to us? Why can't we stop him? But uh, he was always he's always a, a good player to have out there, and he'd have his – He'd have his sons come out and play, and he outlasted them playing in the league too. He sure so. did. Yes, he did. <laughs> He's uh, and I bet he would still play today if he really wanted to. So, uh, but congratulations to uh, Kenny in the uh, Hall of Fame class. And what a great guy! Yes. Right. <laughs> Here's the next one. The uh, next inductee into the class 2017 Hall of Fame is from teams such as Top Dog and the Pain. Number two, Charles Posey. Yeah, Posey. Uh... I, you know, Posey was kind of a small guy. I'm sure he still is. I doubt you grow after you're in your mid 30s. But um, he was everywhere. He would play linebacker, but he pulled flags down the field and in the backfield, and you know where the corner was supposed to be. It was so frustrating. And then when he played on offense, his thing was is they would pass him the ball. He would run toward the line of scrimmage or pass the line of scrimmage and then fake a pass forward which would make whoever was there jump which was so <laughs> silly you felt so stupid when he did that to you but you just, you just had to he, um, you know Posey was always a super nice guy um, he helped uh, organize that team for a long time when I played against them they were called the pain I asked him which team he wanted to be inducted under and he said top dog so I think that was probably before my time but uh, I always enjoyed playing with Posey and he was always a, a Super good competitor. I mean, uh, of course, remembering that you know he was a good player and good athlete out there. But the thing that I re things that I remember the most about Posey is that was probably where I had my first on field arguments with a player. Is 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 he and I just going at each other 
you know, just verbally wanting to uh, just make each other mad, do something. And he never got flustered. He always he liked he liked being a. Uh, you know, in verbal confrontations on the field, just like I did. I think that's where I learned a lot of my uh, the way I would uh, talk to people. It's from Posey, so he's Hall of Fame in my book for on the field and uh, in getting in people's head too. Well, what a great guy! <laughs> okay, we have one more, and our final inductee into the Hall of Fame. This is uh, not a player, but a uh, a man who really kept the Beaumont League uh, going for a long time. Uh, did a good job and was the referee and ref. On the was the only ref on the field most of the time, and would take charge and keep it in, uh, keep everything going. And that's uh, Kenneth Pickens, referee. You know the funny thing about uh, Kenny Pickens and actually my dad were they were the very first two referees to referee any event for our league. So they refereed the first games of the uh, football's coming tournament, the, the very first one. And I've always appreciated what Kenny's done. You know, Kenny had. The Beaumont League down at the uh, at the the YMCA off of uh, Sarah Street in Beaumont. He also he he did one at the Salvation Army for a long time. And Kenny's leagues to me, when I was young, when I was in you know my late teens and early twenties, were the most fun things ever. That's kind of what I always hoped for our league to be is that much fun. Now you know we have more technology now. We can put stuff online. We can do everything else. But trying to match that level of fun to me is the challenge because it was fun. People showed up. You know, Kenny had so many contacts with the community. He also referees basketball and does a lot of stuff for kids' teams and things like that. He made it really fun. And people wanted to play, and they really liked it and got into it. And that's what I've always wanted our league to be. So I appreciate everything that Kenny's done for the sport. I, I, I think he's awesome. He, he did a good job. Uh, he, he really – you know, put a lot of time and effort into it that he didn't have to. I mean, he was the only one running it. He was the, the and he ran the entire league. Kenny was the whole league. He did the entire thing, refed everything, put all the schedule together. Sometimes the schedule wouldn't match up when you show up out there, but hey, we everybody still played. I was about to say, you know what? Even <laughs> if it didn't, Kenny had somebody there for you to play. Exactly. You played a game every week. Uh, you may have played the same team three or four weeks in a row, but you were playing a game. You were out there playing, and your schedule, you you know, it made you made the playoffs, and you played for the championship every year so it was uh it was fun and uh like playing out at the ymca some controversial endings a few times and oh, playing yeah. out at the uh it salvation flag football but what there weren't controversies that's but. right and uh but it was it was fun he did a great job and he's very deserving of being a hall of fame inductee as well so congratulations kenny and what a great guy yeah so those are our hall of fame uh, members for this year um if you have a nominee that you'd like to uh, go in the hall of fame you can send us a, uh, a message on Facebook or uh, tweet us on Twitter or send us an email. However you want to communicate is fine. Um, the only prerequisites of all that are that they can't be playing flag football anymore or they have to be over 50 years old. So that's about it. Um, if you'll stay tuned, our, our next segment, actually it's going to be a bonus segment since this is technically the last segment of today. Our bonus segment will have to do with a lot of uh, chicanery and Game of Thrones talk. So uh, if you want to listen to that, stay tuned. If you don't want to listen to it, then go back to doing whatever the hell you're doing. Good luck. So, um, well, we had a name for it, and then we forgot the name like five minutes after we named it. That's actually very true. But uh, So, today we're going to talk about Game of Thrones, and we're just going to opine and pine and, I don't know, probably muse about it. So, Troy, your thoughts on Game of Thrones so far? Oh, by the way, before we start this segment, if you haven't seen Game of Thrones... Uh, there are a lot of spoilers in what we're going to say, so you should probably turn it off and get caught up before we do that, because, like I've said before, we really like the show, so we've seen all the episodes, so uh, there's the disclaimer. So, Troy, give me your Game of Thrones stuff. Well, obviously the uh, most recent episode is one of the best uh, 
with his action with the dragons, being able to actually be in battle for the first time, seeing them just destroy the Lannister army was impressive. Uh, I enjoyed that. Uh, got a few theories of mine that I feel like uh, could happen, I feel like should happen, would make the show a lot uh, more just the way it should be. People, you know, the wrong people dying, things like that. I think my first theory is that uh, one of the dragons is going to be killed sometime during the battle, during the battle, and the night, uh, the Night King and the White Walkers will rise him from the dead, and he will become a, a an ice breathing dragon. He will become a White Walker night dragon. A night dragon will become a White Walking dragon. So okay. I think that's one of my theories. That's going to happen sometime within between now and the end of the season, which is only nine episodes away now, the end of the, the end of the series. So I think that's going to happen. I can't wait to see if that happens. Okay, well, let me tell you about my, my first theory is that, okay, Jon Snow is a Targaryen or whatever. So if he's a Targaryen and he can be unburnt like uh, Daenerys, yes. then when he, I think he's going to get killed in a battle. They're going to try to burn him, you know, so he doesn't turn into a White Walker because everyone still thinks he's a half bastard Stark. Yep. And uh, he's going to rise up as a. a uh, a White Walker, because he was unburnt, and he's going to probably be a lot like Uncle Benjamin, and kind of like a half and half, and do stuff in that way. That's one. That was one of my theories also. Is that was one of the first things I thought of when the season started, uh, and I think just my the way I think it's going to end up is that, and I, I hate this type of ending, but I think he is going to actually be half human enough to, and he's going to overthrow or kill the Night King, and become make a become the leader of the White Walkers and be the create a peace between humans and the White Walkers. That's how I think it's gonna happen. I would hate that ending. It's like a storybook ending. I would hate that ending, but I think that's what's gonna happen. Just in my mind, that's one of those right. series. So, I so let me ask you some questions. Okay, so here's my first question. What do you think has come of Gendry? <sighs> we haven't seen him since like season two, and I think he is the rightful king of the Seven Kingdoms. He should be on the throne in King's Landing right now. Because you think he's, he's Cersei he's Robert's Cersei baby, right? He's Robert Baratheon's baby, yes. So okay. I think he should be the actual... And he hasn't... He's got to be around somewhere. He's got to make an appearance sometime because he, he has they too just, many abs to not. Well, yeah. <laughs> but they send him off, and he hasn't been back, and... You know, when they show actual, you know, the, the previews of the actual actors at the movie, like then they show the preview, uh, the season premiere or whatever, he was at the premiere of the show in Hollywood. So I'm thinking he's got to be in the episode or in the season somewhere. So I think he's going to make an appearance and something's going to happen. I mean, they've got to, all this stuff has to get around that they know that they find out that John's a Targaryen and they find out that Gendry's actually the rightful king of, uh, of Westeros. So. I don't know. Something has to happen. I, I'm just uh, it, there's not enough episodes. Okay. Here's, here's my other question: <laughs> Is Jamie alive right now? I think Jamie is alive right now because if you're gonna kill him off, why not just kill him off with the dragon breathing, you know, killing him instead of having him drown, which just seems kind of anticlimactic. Okay, then how's he com- how's he coming back? I think Braun gets down there and pulls him up. I think they get away. That are, and I think what happens is he looked pretty deep well, down there. What, this is this is my on. this is my theory about that. I don't think it was really that deep because if you watch how they're running on land and all of a sudden they fall, fall in this abyss, I don't think he really did. I think that was just how he felt falling down in that water with all the armor. He probably thought he was a lot deeper. And that was more dramatic for the effect of the show how it just ended. So I think he was probably only a few feet deep. Yeah, maybe. And then they'll pull him up, and the, but the thing is, he's going to be right there where the dragon still is. So you think the dragon would just burn him again? So, anyway, I think he'll he's this, and this leads me to my next theory, is that Jamie is going to come back somewhere, and I really feel like uh, Arya is going to kill Jamie, and then Arya is is going to kill Cersei because she's on her list of people to kill. Arya is going to kill Cersei as Jamie. Because Cersei's been told that her younger brother is going to kill her. Jamie is her younger brother by just a few minutes. So I think Jamie is going to be the one to kill her, but it's going to be Arya killing her as Jamie, since she can wear the mask. She can wear his mask. She's the, I think that's what's going to happen. That's my theory on how that happens. Or just, Jamie's going to die somehow, and, and Arya's going to be able to use his face for her, and she's going to kill Cersei as Jamie. Okay, well, I like that. Um, a theory that I don't think many people have explored is the uh, 
the likelihood that the show of Game of Thrones and Modern Family merge together <laughs> and it becomes like Modern Thrones or Game of Family or something like that and they transition to network television and the, the gay parents adopt Arya to be the older sister of the Asian child and then Jamie Lannister um, stabs that wimpy dad in the back to kill him and then takes his wife. So that's kind of what I think is going to happen. I think they'll merge those two shows and um, maybe after that they'll have a third merger merger of uh, I don't know, like house or something and there'll be a hospital. Now they're going to merge with Rick and Morty. <laughs> well, How about that? <laughs> I don't think that'll happen. That's a cartoon and that's silly. <laughs> oh, man, what was I thinking? <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, I have no other theories on Game of Thrones simply because I have no clue what... I mean, Euron's out there doing crazy stuff yes. with Yara and Theon's got to have a an ending to his story. There's Dothraki flying everywhere. Every show's like a movie. So, you know, I have no clue. I, I still and I still feel like John. This is another theory that I thought it could happen if the dragon doesn't turn into an ice dragon. I think James John is going to find a dragon egg while he's digging up all the dragon glass while he's mining the dragon glass. He's going to find a dragon egg somewhere down there that's going to either he's going to use that for himself and he's going to fly it or it's going to be an ice dragon. I don't know. It's something I just feel like something different's going to happen that. Uh, where there's another dragon also, involved. Don't forget that Samwell is now looking through all these scrolls that he has to rewrite, yep. and he knows something's going to be yeah. like really important through all that shit. That's the reason why that Maester told him to do that. I think there's going to be something there for him to find, and he's going to, yeah, it's going to help. Maesters, John. man, they they have a lot of dirty chamber pots that need <sighs> uh, yeah emptying. Oh, and Jorah's got to make an, a return to. She's going to help. Uh, Daenerys because Tyrion sucks at military At planning, this rate, so. they're going to have to kill off one main character a show to even end the thing. Yeah. So, it, you know, I love that show. It's awesome. It's only uh, slightly less awesome than the football's coming tournament. So there you go. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. Darn. Football Football is coming. You have anything else? Oh, no, I'm just excited for... Uh, for this weekend for the football. I can't wait. I'm fired up. Game of Thrones is awesome. I can't wait for Sunday for the next episode. But that's going to be after we play football and we crown a champion. All right, guys. Well, go football. Uh, go flag football. And uh, thank you all for listening. We'll uh, try to do this every week or two. So stay tuned. We appreciate it. Thank you.